night, creatures of the night. Welcome to Talking Taker, episode 131 of our encyclopedic exploration, digging up the career of the greatest professional wrestling character of all tism, The Undertaker. My name is Alex Dorio, and I am one of your co-hosts, one of your creatures of the night, and I want to thank you for joining us for yet another round of Dead Man Talking. And I am here joined, as always, by my wrestling buddy, my tag team partner, my fellow creature of the night. He is my New York City travel partner, Mr. Travis White. And Travis, that was the big news on last week's episode. We're traveling up to New York to go one-on-one with The Undertaker. But this week, tonight, you're not going to be my travel partner. You're going to be my play date to the Devil's Playground (laughs) as we go for the eighth time ever inside hell in a cell oh man playtime is over that's gonna be the slogan <laughs> devil's playground playtime is over there you go <laughs> and then that's what Oscar taker should say when he slams the door behind him <laughs> he comes in <laughs> oh that'd be great oh man yeah and we found out too from well we'll, we'll leave that for later but some people are going to be up there with us in new york new york so excited can't Excited to wait. meet some folks. Man, three and a half years in the making, buddy. Or I guess I, well, yeah. no, two and a half years in the making, I guess. Two and a half. Yeah. Uh, but, man, incredible. We're going to meet The Undertaker. Yeah, we'll talk more about that later. But uh, right now we're going to watch The Undertaker like we do every single week, going match by match through his career, every pay-per-view match. And we've reached Survivor Series 2007. Like I said, his eighth. Hell in a Cell match, this time going up against Batista, sort of the culmination of their rivalry here, a match you and I had not really seen previously to this, Mm -hmm. uh, but we are excited to talk about it, and man, um, I don't know, it's a good one. Yeah, it's good, I'm excited to talk about it because like you said, I've seen highlights and bits and pieces of it, but never the full thing in one sitting, so this was really fun to go back and watch and kind of complete their... uh, what, what do you call it? Uh, the, their pentology? Uh, yeah, not a rivalry. Pentology? Right. Yeah, not a, a rivalry. A feud. <laughs> and they're, uh, they're can kind of complete their singles uh, pentology of 2007, if you will. So, yeah, absolutely. Anyway. And I've always heard Batista in, in like, uh, interviews say that, you know, 2007 and 2005 was, was a great, great year. But he says, you know, 2007 is really when he was cemented as, like, a main event guy. And, uh, and I've, I've, you know, I remember the earlier part of the year with those, but this this later stuff, like he's right, man. And we'll get into that as we kind of break this match down. So, I was thinking the exact same thing as watching this, man. That this whole rivalry has just really cemented him as a legend, as a Hall of Famer. I mean, you you can point to mm-hmm. these matches as taking him up to just another level. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. So, but. Yeah, go ahead. Things gonna get started somewhere. So yeah, go <laughs> ahead. Let's break down this SmackDown because again, the build ups to these matches really aren't that great. <laughs> yeah, that's been the thing uh, that we've noticed throughout the Batista Undertaker rivalry. The matches have been outstanding four, four and a half, five stars uh, for all of these matches, but the build up has just left a lot to be desired. And this week, it's not going to be all that different as we take our time traveling hearse back to November of 2007. We're going to pick up on November 2nd, 2007. Uh, Batista had just claimed his first victory over this entire year over The Undertaker at Cyber Sunday 2007. Got a nice clean pinfall over him, Stone Cold as the referee there. So that even their feud up to one and one uh, with two draws or two ties there in the middle. And now we're going to have to have the rubber match, the fifth match in their series here. Uh, But before that, we're going to get the thing that I think has, in my opinion, I don't know how you feel about this, Travis, but... The thing that has really dragged this feud down a lot is so many tag team matches with Batista and The Undertaker. It's just like once or twice is okay, but that's kind of been like the thing that they've just leaned on so much. Instead of having a rivalry, they just throw these guys in tag matches. And the SmackDown is going to have Batista and Undertaker versus Kali and Mark Henry. And I really don't know why. 
Well, I think it's because I'm trying to make chicken salad here. Okay. So at the pay per view before, uh, what what was it? What was the one before Cyber Sunday? Uh, Unforgiven. Unforgiven. Uh, yep, yep, yep. I don't know. Whatever we covered two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Taker beat Mark Henry in the main event, and Batista beat Kali for the world title. So that was their last singles feuds, I guess. So, you know, WWE booking is, well, you got two singles wrestlers feud, and put them, put them in a tag match. You know, so I guess that's why. But, yeah, there's really no there's no history between Kali and Mark Henry, really, as a tag team. So I don't know. But you're right, man. Like, that's a great point in that this this whole feud. They, these guys hadn't touched. And then in February, they started tagging as a once-in-a-lifetime tag team. <laughs> and then they tag multiple times throughout the months. And then when Taker's gone for four months, when they come back, they just tag again over and over again. So I didn't think about it until you pointed that out a second ago. But that's right, man. There are other ways to have them not touch each other right, than have them right. tag. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. It, it's really hard to do babyface versus babyface. And, yes. you know, I, I, think it's, I think you can do it short term. But the fact that it's been dragged out for – Wow, I mean, almost nine months at this February. point, and, yeah. and neither guy has ever turned heel the whole time. It's getting a little stale. Right. Uh, the feud, sure. the matches are still good every time, but the feud, the rivalry itself, a little stale. But anyway, Batista opens up the show. He's obviously in a great mood uh, from defeating The Undertaker last night, and he points out that he did something he never thought he'd do in his entire career. Uh, he calls it the biggest win of his entire career. And again, as we've seen kind of through this, the fans kind of mixed towards Batista. Uh, it's tough. They have a hard time cheering him against The Undertaker, and this night is no different. Uh, but Batista says, in his eyes, the two of them are even. Uh, they've both got that one win with the two draws between them. And he mentions that their feud is not over, uh, but since they're in the tag team match tonight... Since they're even, he's going to have The Undertaker's back, and he wants to know tonight if The Undertaker is going to watch his. Well, speak of the devil, he's going to show up, the gong hits, lights go out, and The Undertaker is in the ring, standing behind Batista, and they have a little stare down, and Batista, or excuse me, Undertaker tells Batista that yes, indeed, he's got his back tonight, because Batista has what he wants. Batista still has the world title, so... Batista looks down on his shoulder at that world title and says, dude, if you want a rematch, you got it. And he starts to walk away and Undertaker stops him and says, Batista. Fifth match in the series. They're going to amp it up. To the Undertaker, his signature match, I would say at this point, Hell in a Cell. Oh yeah, and what about dude? What, what did Batista did last year before WrestleMania? He was like, "Give me what I want! Give me what I want! Give me what I want! Give me what I want!" <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Batista's whole thing with Triple H that would have been great if he did it right here. That'd been awesome. But been yeah, good. man, like you said, <laughs> Taker's signature signature match at this point. He's had all kinds of buried alive's and you know caskets, and at least he didn't say Batista. Uh, what are some of those dump matches that we had against like X against <laughs> uh, Armageddon uh, for our final rules curtain match? match. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> final curtain match. Oh, <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. Well, simple, simple, basic. Um, I do want to point out afterward, Jamie Noble is backstage talking to Vicky Guerrero again, and J- Vicky Guerrero tells him he's going to be in another match, and <laughs> Jamie Noble assumes that. You know, she's been putting him in these terrible matches week after week. He's like, oh, no, you, you're not going to put me in hell in a cell against Batista and Undertaker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which, sign me up, dude. Make that a triple hell threat. Yeah. I'm here for it. <laughs> he would bounce all over that cell like a oh rag doll. God, I would love it so much. Yeah. No, no, he's just going to fight Rey Mysterio tonight. But anyway, later on... Uh, yeah. Great Kali, he's back again in our lives, unfortunately. <sighs> Him and Mark Henry talk strategy backstage with Kali. He's got a new manager since we last cover him. He's got uh, Ranjin Singh instead of uh, Davari. And this guy, I th- he think he was a writer on the creative team for a long time, and they just threw him with Kali for the reason of his skin color, basically. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> 
Right. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what it was. So uh, that's the main event tonight is this tag team match. A, another long, long TV match. And Undertaker indeed has Batista's back. He saves him from Kali's vice grip that he puts him in. And then Undertaker gets the hot tag and our tag team specialist, he runs wild. He's house of fire coming in there. He, he even goes for a double choke slam on Mark Henry and the great yeah. Kali. Maybe a little <laughs> overconfident there. <laughs> Dude, that ring would have burst. Oh my God. <laughs> Splintered in half. Would have been incredible. Those guys hit at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, Batista runs in. He, him, and Undertaker are about to both hit power bombs on these guys. When all of a sudden, JBL runs in from the commentary table and gives Batista a clothesline out of nowhere. And I was just sitting there watching this, like, what the heck is going on? And Kali and Henry, they continue the beatdown on Taker and Batista. JBL goes back to the commentary table, puts his headset on, and says, Put your hands on me! You want to put your hands on me? That's what happened! There will be bodies left laying with JBL's gun! I don't care if I'm an announcer! I am still a wrestling gun! And the longest reigning world champion in SmackDown television history! These two guys want to disrespect me, Batista and Undertaker! Oh no! Then look at him! And John, look at him! You know, as we covered on here, Undertaker and Batista both got their shots in on JBL when he was campaigning to be the special referee of that Cyber Sunday match. And he says, this is payback on these men putting their hands on him. I'm not retired. I'm retired. I'm not dead. And he says, he's acting like he's going to start this rivalry with Taker and Batista. I mean, I don't know. What do you think of this? I had no idea, like, where this came from. I mean, I understand that. It took like speared him and beat him up before the uh, you know the the match at Cyber Sunday. But did Taker put his hand? I don't remember Taker putting his his hands on JBL. Did I forget that? Didn't he give him a choke slam like when he was trying to give him a t shirt and stuff? Oh yeah, okay, he did. I tried to block that out of my mind, but yeah, he did. You're right. Um, but yeah, it's just like. But this doesn't lead to anything. Yes. We're going to talk Spoiler about it just in the next couple weeks. Yeah. This doesn't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem I had with it. I wasn't – at this point, I was like, oh, okay. Well, they're going to have him inserted in his feud. Because I know he comes back to wrestle in 2008, I believe it is. Um, but I was like, well, maybe he came back a little earlier than I thought because I wasn't watching at this point. So, um, no. Nope. Doesn't do anything. Goes off on these guys. Like, he cuts a promo on them, mm-hmm. like you said. And – doesn't go, doesn't do anything. That was my problem with it. It makes it seem like he's about to be Colin and Mark Henry's new manager or something. Which yeah, I mean that would have been kind of cool. I, I could have seen like a, a faction with that. And JBL, he's so good on the mic during this time. I wouldn't have minded him yeah. being a manager for some sort of heel faction. But yeah, it, it they tease something else a little bit on this next episode of SmackDown and then completely forget about it. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. So, yeah, the next week is November 9th of 2007, and we get a graphic at the beginning telling us that we're getting Taker versus the Punjabi Nightmare, oh. the great Kali. And I just wrote, yeah, you're telling me. He's my Punjabi <laughs> Nightmare. Anytime he's in a ring, I'm having a nightmare. Oh, man. Pinch me and wake me up from this nightmare. It's crazy. Uh, but apparently that was on WWE.com this week, and we found out that it was Taker's request to have a no holds barred match. So, good on. I guess he wants to make sure that he can beat this bully. So anyway, we uh, see a promo for Hell in a Cell and highlighting the brutality of Hell in a Cell. And Batista comes out to cut a promo later on. He's got a black tank top on underneath his suit. So (laughs) (laughs) he's he's business. He's casual. He's business casual. Business casual for sure. He's like, uh, (laughs) for sure. I mean, the complete like opposites, like super business. And super casual at the same time. <laughs> I don't get it. So, uh, But anyway, he comes out, and as he makes his entrance, JBL takes a phone call. He's on the phone with somebody. He apologizes that he has to leave the commentary table, kind of telling Michael Cole. Uh, he says, oh, I'm sorry, i got to go. And he hops the rail and leaves, which is, again, it's awesome <laughs> playing into the fact that like he's going to get involved and be part of the storyline. But he disappears, and um, I really a- like the way he pulled it off. Such a great heel move. <laughs> It's like, yeah, oh, I, I like, gotta take a phone call while Batista's yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and runs away like a coward. Yeah, 
and it was very Bobby Heenan as like you mentioned yes. last week. This is the most Heenan stuff that JBL's ever done. You know, the stuff from the last few weeks. And so really I really, really liked it. I was looking forward to it going somewhere, but we'll pretty much pump the brakes right there. Mm-hmm. So um but anyway, we uh Batista says that he and Taker are not friends. They don't like each other, but he is pulling for the Undertaker tonight because he doesn't want Taker to be softened up by the great Kali. He wants Taker at 100% at Hell in a Cell. He wants him to be, because he's in the best shape of his life. He's in the best shape of his career. Survivor Series, Hell in a Cell, I'm putting it all on the line. My body, my health, my career, my life, and the World Heavyweight Championship. Yeah! Words, and he's putting it all on the line at Hell in a Cell, and he slams the mic down. And that just drew me to something. This is kind of off topic, but at what point did it become okay to slam the microphones down? <laughs> I'm not sure. They do it all the time nowadays, but to think back to the attitude here, those guys slam them down. They didn't, and that was the most like off the rails stuff that we ever got. Right? Like yeah. I don't know, man. Like I just, I don't know. I just. Those things gotta cost a fortune, and yeah. I just feel like these nowadays everyone slams it in every promo. They throw it behind them or whatever. But like, I don't know. It's like I just an feel like I really noticed it here on the promo. Yeah, but like, I, I mean, I don't. I just don't. I mean, when promos were so much better back in the Attitude Era, like, or even like the Rock and Wrestling when those guys, like, you didn't see Roddy Piper slam the mic down, you know, and throw it away. Nah, because I don't know. I they had, mean they Gene had was holding it up for him. Well, that's true. That's true. They had respect for the mic, man. I want them to respect the mic in the ruthless aggression era. So well, they don't. I tell you what, I respected this promo. I think I think this promo was shorter than Batista's entrance. Yeah, but it was great. He, yeah, I loved it. There was no uh, no fluff to it, man. He said what he no. needed to say. He dropped the mic and he got out of there. And that's Batista at his best, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. You pointed that out a couple times on the last few episodes, talking about him. That is when he's at his best, and he must have been listening to a lot of John Merritt at the time when he got in the ring just said say what you need to say and he gets out of there so it was good stuff <laughs> it's about the, the same opposite. time yeah. <laughs> about the time that song came out yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was about yeah I think that's right yeah yeah so you know he learned from he's an evolution with Flair and Triple H but he did not take the uh promo you know <laughs> Same promo school that they did because he just gets in and gets out. <laughs> I could totally see Batista and John Mayer hanging out. <laughs> they oh, like look they at this outfit be, he's wearing. Yeah, like they would be best friends. <laughs> yeah, they could definitely hang out, man. So that's <laughs> great stuff. Just imagine the pairings. I want to ride along now, Batista Absolutely. and John Mayer. Absolutely. Say what you need. Say. Yeah, good stuff. Well, oh, later man. on we got. Uh, <laughs> um, Excuse me, I'm, I'm lost here. Uh, we're going to get, like I said, Taker versus Kali. No holes barred match is the main event. And um, Taker and, or excuse me, Cole and JBL run down the Survivor Series card. And uh, man, they were, what a card. Hey, it's definitely. <laughs> who's uh, Kali facing at Survivor Series? Uh, the Hornswoggle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's like Mr. Man's dream match right there. Oh, yeah. That's like Big Show's nightmare match. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kali versus Hornswoggle because that's supposed to be funny. So <laughs> thank God I wasn't watching this. But um, yeah, we got Kali goes – I mean, Kali gets straight punched right, right as soon as the bell rings in the beginning of this match. <laughs> Taker just takes it to him, man. Hits old school immediately and then a choke slam like just right off the, out, the, out the gate, man. <laughs> I really I thought liked- he was going to – pin him right there uh, me i was i was so excited that he was gonna <laughs> yes. pin him in like 48 seconds i was into it but it's not really that long of a match he actually does want to beat him pretty quickly uh kali does go for the vice grip and and of course taker breaks it this is the first one to break the vice grip so he's gonna hit a choke slam and then attempt a tombstone and then kali's gonna hit that he's gonna slide out of that and hit that double choke lift tree slam and then taker sits up and as Kali goes down to grab him, he's going to choke him in that triangle choke. Again, it's not named Hell's Gate yet, but he gets him the, the triangle choke, and Kali's actually going to tap out, which yeah. I was very shocked. I, I had no idea that was going to happen. So very shocked. But it does put over that, that move and how good it is, and that Taker is beating a quote-unquote credible opponent. He's a former world champion at this point. I don't think he's credible. You don't think he's credible. Most people don't, but in the eyes of – the fact that he's a former champion, True. he's credible. So, yeah. So he poses the, uh, at the end to, and does a little discount double check belt taunt and closes the show. And um, 
I just like JBL's back on commentary at this point, and I just wonder why he didn't take her didn't slip out and go after him. Like they, they just completely abandoned that. Nothing. Yeah, like nothing at all. And did I miss something? Was there anything at all in this match that warranted it being no holds barred? Did I like not pay attention? Um, I don't remember them doing anything except for there was no referee count on the outside, and they mentioned like, "Oh, the referee's not counting because it's no okay. old barred." Okay, so that so was there was it. no but, like, chairs and tables or anything weird, no. random like that. No, <laughs> no. Ranjan Singh doesn't even like I me. Mean, he gets he distracts the referee, but like you don't have to. It's no holds barred. Yeah, like you don't have to distract the referee in that. You can just get in the ring and beat him up if you want to. So, yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, this I don't even. I don't know what to call it. I don't know if SmackDown is just on autopilot or it's just an afterthought kind of in this state uh, in this stage, but man, it's just real, real sloppy here, real sloppy booking. And yeah, the whole JBL Mark Henry, great Kali stuff. It's, it's not going anywhere here on this, the go home show for survivor series here, uh, real quick right. three week build up here. It's always tough to do that real quick turnaround in between the pay-per-views, but uh, this is the Go Home Show on November 16, 2007. Uh, we recap last week, quote unquote, where, I mean, you didn't cover this, Travis, uh, but apparently Batista had a promo telling Mark Henry that he hasn't forgot him, that he put on, him on the shelf for six months, and he hasn't forgotten what he did to him the week before, and he's going to unleash all his fury on, uh, on Mark Henry uh, tonight. And, uh, yeah, they act like this was on SmackDown last week, but, uh, you didn't cover it. <laughs> no, because it wasn't there. I, I went back <laughs> when I was watching the 16th episode, I went back to the ninth and watched that promo again. And I watched, I watched through every little thing. I read recaps. So the shows like multiple different websites, I read recaps to see if I missed that promo not there. It is not even there, That's but they so put weird. it on here. Like it's last week. And it makes sense if it was from that week, because, he did attack him the week before. He, he he did put him down. Like once JBL interfered, I think Mark Henry put him down with a bear hug and a pow- and the um, world's strongest slam. But like, bro, this was not on SmackDown. I don't know if they edited it from earlier in the year when Mark Henry came back, or if it was there and they cut it out like on the actual broadcast. I don't know. But dude, it was some phantom menace, dude. Some it's just some <laughs> phantom thing came in. I don't know what happened, man. Well, maybe this is one of those dot com things. Maybe they edited it out and put it on dot com or something. But they're acting like it, it happened on been. this show. Yeah, uh, and that's going to be the main event for tonight. So Taker fought Kali yeah. last week. Batista's fighting Mark Henry this week. Uh, Undertaker comes out for his promo for the pay per view. Makes a grand entrance. All the bells and whistles here. And uh, Cole and JBL are putting over how he's been in Hell in a Cell more times than anyone. Uh, like we said, seven times up to this point. Uh, Undertaker, another short and sweet promo. He gets straight to the point. And he says, Hell in a Cell. It's been called the Devil's Playground. But no one, including the devil himself, has entered that demonic structure more times than the Undertaker. And no man who stepped inside that cell has come out quite the same. So I guess we could call it the Dead Man's Playground. So he wants to change it to the dead man's playground. And he tells Batista that his fate Pirates will be... Caribbean, episode six, coming at you. Dead, dead man's, man's playground. playground. <laughs> I can see it. Yeah, I think that's what it's going to be. Uh, uh, yeah, why not at this point? <laughs> uh, he tells Batista he will lose the World Heavyweight Championship and he will rest in peace. So pretty simple, basic, solid, straight to the point. I love it. Uh, mm-hmm. And then the main event is Batista and Mark Henry. And Mark Henry, man, he drew the short straw because he <laughs> gets murdered here. <laughs> Batista makes short work of him in like three minutes oh. in a no DQ match. Yeah. Uh, Batista hits a spine buster, rolls outside, grabs the world title, 
busts it over Mark Henry's head and then pins him <laughs> right there. As yeah, if he's like what? the Brooklyn then, Brawler or something. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely puts us over, like, Batista's strength to, to beat this guy. But, like, who did Mark Henry tick off backstage? Like, this is bad. Well, he might have ticked off Mar- uh, George Lucas, who's sitting in the front row of this episode of SmackDown, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, this dude looks just like George Lucas. I want to challenge everybody to go back and watch. And again, this match only takes like literally three minutes. But there is when when Batista throws him in the timekeeper area. There is a George Lucas doppelganger right there. Man. I noticed him. So, yeah, for sure. Did you? Okay, yeah, he is there. I was like, oh my word. He's getting some. Uh, maybe he's taking notes, trying to make uh, the sequels to the Star Wars. It never got off the ground been. for him. So. <laughs> Well, Batista, he, he, I guess he's auditioning in front of him as he chokes Mark Henry with the video cables, rams him into the ring post, hits a spear on him, hits Mark Henry with a chair. He is unloading on him. And then he gets in the ring. He's yeah. starting to celebrate. The gong hits. The purple haze kind of envelops the arena. And The Undertaker's eyes appear on the SmackDown <laughs> Tron. Just his eyes. <laughs> And then they roll into the back of his head, and Batista stares at him as the show goes off the air. So <laughs> it's uh, it's something different, I guess. It's a little awkward, but uh, it's uh, it's something different, uh, as you could say. Uh, I almost thought I was going to hear uh, that tattoo song. All the things you said. All the things you said. Because wasn't that uh, oh, it's like what's Victoria's her name? Yeah, when that song came on? Yeah. Victoria. Just the eyes on there. <laughs> I'd be okay if that yeah, it was man. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All the things you said running through my head, dude. It was uh, yeah. I mean, we've always talked about how with these this build up for these these two guys has been missing the mind games type stuff. But yeah. I don't know, man. This is a <laughs> well, step in the wrong direction. It's just like <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> kind of weird. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how we end the build up to Survivor Series. So yeah, uh, I don't know. Well, you know, we got kind of a shortened episode this week with just the short build and we're talking about Batista auditioning in front of George Lucas. Uh, Travis, I, th- <laughs> I-, <laughs> I thought maybe <laughs> maybe this would be a good time kind of to fill this episode out. I could talk about the time that I uh, I started a movie with Batista a couple years ago and, and, yeah. t- and took a bump from him. So. Uh, maybe, yeah, I don't need you to tell us about that. Yeah. So uh, two years ago, or a year and a half ago, summer of 2018, I was an extra in the movie Stuber, starring Batista and Kumail Nanjiani. And I have to admit, I have yet to see the movie. Uh, I will watch it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, So I cannot confirm or deny if I'm actually in the movie, but I'm 98% sure you don't ever see me in the movie. But I I did spend a night on the set with Batista there. And, uh, you know, a little backstory. If you have watched movies or TV in the past five or ten years, chances are something you've seen has been shot in Atlanta, which is where I live. You know, it's kind of... They shoot so many movies and TV shows here uh, nowadays. And uh, for a lot of 2018, I did some background work in a bunch of movies and TV shows. I was unemployed for a lot of 2018 and uh, doing background work in these movies. They have all these Facebook groups you can join in to audition and you just send in a headshot and uh, go to work on the set for like, you know, somewhere between six and 15 hours <laughs> and uh, right. it's a nice easy way to make like a hundred bucks or, or a little bit more uh, depending on the shoot. So uh, yeah, I, I, I saw the casting call for Stuber a new Batista was going to be in it. I thought, well, that sounds cool. Maybe I'll see Batista on set and ended up being on there uh, for the set for that movie was supposed to do it with our buddy Gibbs, who uh, has been to, some of these pay-per-views that we recently talked about on there, but he, uh, he no showed me on the, the day of the shoot and never showed up. Uh, <laughs> I forgot about that. Classic Gibbs. Yeah. Classic. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this was, you know, I, um, 
it, it's not as glamorous as it sounds, folks, if you've never uh, done anything like this. Um, basically, this was a... Uh, there's there's a variety of different scenes you could be a background worker in and uh, you know a background worker is just you know it's not one of the main actors you don't have any lines it's just one of the random people like you know when a scene takes place in a restaurant or uh you know this one took place outside was supposed to be outside of a la clippers game so there's just a big crowd happening outside this thing so there was over a hundred background actors there uh, you know, just kind of walking in the background of the scene. That's all it is. So you really don't, you can't really pick any of us out in the background of it. Uh, it took place at our, the Brave Stadium here in Atlanta, which is like 10 minutes from my house. And they have this whole, all these restaurants and businesses outside the stadium. And they totally transformed it for the shoot to make it look like it was outside of an LA Clippers game. So they replaced all the Braves paraphernalia with Clippers stuff. They had everybody wearing Clippers jerseys. That's pretty cool. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, and it's a, like I said, I haven't seen the movie, but it's a scene where Batista, his partner in the movie is Karen Gillian or, or Gillen. I don't know how you say it, but she's, she's also in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies with him. Um, she's his partner in this movie. And I guess she gets, Oh yeah. She's Nebula. Right. Exactly. Yep. She yeah. gets shot by the bad guy in the movie or attacked or something uh, inside this big crowd. And so basically what we did is, like I said, we're all dressed up in Clippers gear. We, you know, you sit around, you wait for like three or four hours while everybody's getting into costume and makeup and stuff. And then you go outside. It's the middle of the night. It's like two o'clock in the morning because they're shooting it at night. And for a scene like this, you basically start out on one side of the street. The director yells action, and um, there's a bunch of people on one side of the street, a bunch of people on the other side of the street, and you just kind of crisscross. And you just you cross the other side of the street, you wait 10 seconds, and then you cross back to the other side of the street. Then you cross again. You're just trying to create motion on the screen. Right. You know, they're going to, we shot this like 15 times, the same scene. So they're just using different angles. They're just going to splice stuff together. You're not paying attention to what's going on in the background. So you're just like, everybody's just going back and forth uh, a whole bunch of times while Batista yeah. and Karen Gillan and, and the bad guy, whoever they're doing their action and saying their lines and all that stuff. So, uh, the first couple times we shot it, I ended up just by happenstance to just kind of start off right where Batista was starting off in the crowd. I didn't, you know, the directors just kind of place people in different places and you just kind of end up where you are. And the scene starts with Batista just running through the crowd, shoving people out of the way. And the first couple times we shot it, I happen to be one of the guys he like just shoves out of the way as he's trying running to try and go get his partner. <laughs> so man, Dave Batista, he put his hand on me, he pushed me out of the way, and uh, I can I can unofficially say I, I took a bump from Batista. I guess. There you go. I, I didn't quite hit the ground or anything like that, but man, he gave me a shove. So uh, that kind of puts me, I guess, in the category of the Undertaker. I think you could say, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you've taken a bump from him just like Taker has. So absolutely. Yeah, that's a cool story, man. I, I love that. I remember when that happened. Uh, I've kind of forgotten about it, but I remember you telling me about it. It's, know, that's it's, really uh, neat. So, yeah. It's just one of those things. It's like, you know, you don't talk to the guy. They, they, they make a big deal right. when you're on the sets of these movies and TV shows to not talk to the actors unless they talk to you. Because, which makes sense. You know, they're in care. They're working. You know, they're, they're right. trying to be in character. They're trying to remember their lines. They're trying to focus on all their stuff. They can't have 100 people trying to ask for their autographs or ask them about when they wrestle the undertaker or anything like that. Um, and, right. um, I do remember, are you from Macon? <laughs> can't are you ask him Macon? that, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, he was very serious. You know, he was nice. Uh, you know, he, he wasn't like in a, he wasn't like a jerk or anything, but he was definitely yeah. in the zone of this movie. It's supposed to be a very intense scene. Um, and he was kind of doing like the Brock Lesnar dance in between takes, like just trying to get, uh, oh, yeah. hyped up and trying to get a little bit, a little bit of sweat, uh, a little bit of pump on in between each take. 
And uh, the other thing I remember about Batista was he was chugging LaCroix seltzer waters like all <laughs> night long, man. He was just downing them in between each take. He loved them. <laughs> Any particular flavor? I, I couldn't tell which flavor it was, but they just had a cooler over there for like the main actors, <laughs> and he was just pounding them in between each yeah. take. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. But he was he huge. He liked the LaCroix. He did. He loved it, man. Uh, <laughs> he's just a huge man, huge specimen. He was yeah. in great shape. Um, but it was just cool. You know, that's those things, you know. Yeah, it's a cool story. Uh, yeah. I didn't, like, talk to him. I didn't shake his hand or anything. But, you know, I got shoved out of the way by him. And, like I said, I, Even I, better. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm not in the movie because, you know, they shot that scene a whole bunch of times. And I'm, I'm sure they didn't use my take. But uh, you got to be on set. Uh, it was fun. Made a hundred bucks off of it. Got a little fun, little story, and that's what most of that stuff is like. But you know, just uh, thought I'd share that during one of our Batista episodes. Absolutely, and yeah, what better way than when he's in front of George Lucas here on SmackDown? So excellent, <laughs> yeah, fits, perfect right? timing, perfect timing. <laughs> Batista goes Hollywood, we're out, or yeah, Batista goes Hollywood, and so is Alex. So that's awesome. So. But yeah, you you kind of like played the role of like the local indie, like the local Atlanta indie guy. Like mm. if they were if he was mm-hmm. WWE and he was in like, you know, if you were just an extra and he just needed to power bomb you in the ring, you get a hundred bucks that night or whatever. Like so, yeah, you could say that you took a bump for him. That's fine. <laughs> Basically, same, the same story. Thing. You had the same exact story as those guys. You, you got Nick's expertise and he pushed you out of the way and you got a hundred bucks. So there you go. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for sharing that, man. Well, you know, I just thought I'd try to fill this episode out a little bit as we take it to Survivor Series 2007 in Miami, Florida, the American Airlines Arena. And like we've said before, neither one of us had seen this show. This was during our period of not watching wrestling. Uh, I think we've both seen some clips and highlights of it, uh, but it was cool Mm -hmm. to get back and watch it here for the first time ever. Um, I have to say, I did not really understand the graphics and the logo with all the chainsaws and everything for this Survivor Series. I thought that was kind of weird. No. Me neither. Yeah, I don't know what the dealio was with that. I don't know. There's like a new Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie or something that <laughs> came out. Oh, seven. I don't know, man. But yeah, and like on the posters, Edge holding a chainsaw. And he's not even. Uh, yeah. He's not even there yet. <laughs> like, spoiler. Still, he's still out of the injury. <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. So. Oh man, yeah, that's I don't know. That was just kind of, yeah, kind of a big spoiler. But anyway, uh, yeah, I don't I don't get the graphics and stuff. But yeah, everybody's got chainsaws. So, but I will say, dude, pretty neat Survivor Series. It's always an anniversary show for the Undertaker. That was his debut mm-hmm. in 1990, which just sounds so far away uh, here we are in year 2020 30 years later but even then 17 years later at 2007 undertaker is still here at survivor series and he's in the freaking main event for the world title i mean that was impressive yeah. back then oh yeah that's awesome yeah it's really cool again his longevity and his staying power as a main event player is is awesome, man. You know, it, I thought about it too. Like, um, so it's 2020 now. So, you know, think about those Ohio Valley wrestling guys. They've been in, de- you know, the main class we talk about with Randy Orton and Cena and, uh, well, Batista and uh, Brock Lesnar. And, you know, the only one that's been active the entire time is Randy Orton. Mm-hmm. Cena's kind of gone now. You know, he's he didn't even wrestle on pay per view last year. Batista is retired after last year. Lesnar left for what? What was it? Eight years. I think he's been back, you know, since 2012. But he's gone for like eight years, you know. And Randy Orton's been there the whole time, and he is probably the number one heel in wrestling currently yeah. <laughs> because of what he did to Edge. And I just like what, I, the stand power of him too. Like how how neat is that? But anyway, that just occurred to me as we talked about it's been 17 years. I think in like you know 2002 to 2019, like Randy Orton's been at the top of the card most of the time too. So weird. You know, it it seems like we're getting. <laughs> Randy Orton and Edge at WrestleMania, probably, but mm-hmm. yeah. Now that you say that, I wouldn't hate another Randy Orton Undertaker match. You know, no, it's me neither. So be great. long since they had that rivalry, like they could, they could do something cool. Oh yeah, and even if they put it on one of those Saudi shows because they're two big names, right, like that's what they fine. tend to do. Like that'd be yeah. fine with me. I, I wouldn't mind say that at all. But 
Yeah. Have, have you seen the preview for the Ruthless Aggression show on the network? Yes, I can't Dude. wait. Ah, it's going to be awesome. Man. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be awesome. They had a little breakdown of all five episodes, and this basically covers those four guys. Uh, and and then uh, just kind of the whole thing as a whole. So, That's cool. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be really neat. Really neat. But anyway, speaking of Ruthless Aggression guys and those people, most all of them are, are on this pay-per-view. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess two of them, half of Mark and Cena still out with the injury. Again, he tore his pec back in September and supposed to be gone for like nine months, but he's going to come back like Superman in a couple months and uh, surprises us all. And then, of course, Brock Lesnar's gone. But here we got Cole and JBL on commentary for our match here. And again, this is the main event, like you said. Uh, these guys got, got slighted earlier in the year. But here they are, main again. And uh, we see Batista. I really like this part where we see them, him backstage. Like You always talk about that boxing kind of interest where the camera's back there with him following him through the hallway. I like that because we get him, we see Batista backstage, and then we see the you know hear that ominous like dun, 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 music as the, the the cell gets lowered. And this is the what the eighth hell in a cell we've covered. Yeah, this uh, looks like it ate the other seven. <laughs> <laughs> looks like it swallowed the other seven one. And this made this mega Godzilla like cell. It's huge. It is enormous, and yeah, there's nobody jumping off of this cell tonight because no, it might kill him. But <laughs> you know, uh, Batista he comes out first. He's got it. Does his entrance. Does his pyro. Does all that stuff. And Undertaker follows up. Another big entrance with him. All the pyro and smoke and mirrors and all that good stuff. And the announcers again put over that. Undertaker, this is his eighth time inside Hell in a Cell. Uh, they don't mention his record, but he is four and three in his previous outings, so he does have a winning record inside Hell in a Cell. And uh, this is Batista's second time inside Hell in a Cell. He defeated Triple H back in 2005. And uh, JBL notes that if uh, Batista mm-hmm. wins tonight, he will have a victory over Triple H and The Undertaker. And those are the two guys most associated with Hell in a Cell. So Batista, that'd be a huge accomplishment for him to win. You know, you could argue that Hell in a Cell is like the most important match in WWE, especially at this point in time. It's like the biggest uh, uh, stipulation match. Uh, Maybe you could still Mm -hmm. argue that now to this day, but and Batista would kind of win over the kings of that match here. So uh, I thought it was a great point for him to bring up. Yeah, it was, and again, good, good on JBL. But look, he's like, he's like completely forgot the storyline about him hating Batista and it's gone. Like, I did, it's it's completely gone. He calls this match. He's not he's not Bobby Heenan in this match. He's not hating on these guys. He's calling it. He's putting over both of them, even though he's the heel commentator. I don't. I just the whole sidebar with him that that storyline just got dropped in, but. I remember it. I'm watching it. I, I, don't yeah. insult me, you know. Like as a fan, like, I just hate when they drop stuff like this. So, but it's hard to it's hard to drop stuff with an active character who's on TV the entire time. Like JBL, right. it's fine if you like, you know, you have a story like Mike and Maria Canellas had that thing last year, and then they just dropped him off TV for a while. Like that's fine. Just don't put him on TV. But when you got JBL <laughs> who's there every week. Like you can't just drop stuff pretend it didn't happen. So, but anyway. One thing that did happen is Taker's entrance, like you said, he comes out, big old flames, big old flames here. Uh, I guess flames and chainsaws is what we're going to call this, flames and chains. Flames so and chains. Ro- <laughs> flames and chains. Sounds like a Slipknot song or something. But anyway, Taker comes out through the smoke. He wants to smoke. He comes out, takes his jacket off and his hat off outside. And um, his uh, Jimmy Corderas is, is outside, and he's got the, the title out there with him, and I think Taker kind of looks at it. No, he doesn't. He doesn't look at it. He actually walks into the cell, and as you've mentioned in previous podcasts, uh, with, with whether it's a cage match or a cell match, Taker takes that door and he slams it behind him, kind of mm. signifying it's on. And I just, again, I love that little nuance that he has. Oh, it's a, such a cool moment. Just a great mm-hmm. way to intimidate Batista. And Batista is just bug-eyed looking at Undertaker. Oh, yeah. Just waiting in the ring. <laughs> his eyes are jutting out of his head here. And these two guys, they kick things off, uh, go into a lockup to start things off. Um, Batista gets a big clothesline. Undertaker hops right up, gets in some punches. Batista gets in a few of his own. Undertaker jo- goes for a choke slam early on, but Batista fights out of it. 
and Undertaker gets a clothesline right off the bat again and goes for the first two count of the match. Just again, another Undertaker signature there going for early cover. And I, I criticized that and some, some other Hell in a Cell matches of him. Like like the very first one with Shawn Michaels. Like it didn't make sense yeah. for him to be going for covers early on in that match because he wanted to destroy Shawn Michaels and murder him in that match. Right. This one, though, the title's on the line. And Undertaker exactly. wants that belt so bad, I kind of get him going for the mm-hmm. the two counts earlier on. It makes a lot more sense here. I agree wholeheartedly, man. I was going to point that same thing out. You know, it, it this is not like a blood feud where they're trying to rip each other to shreds. You know, this is not a grudge match where they're, you know, abandoning each other. And it's not it's not personal. This is professional. It's about the title, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's. Definitely uh, a difference here and why he's going for the, the, the count so quickly. But, again, Taker's going to drop boots and elbows on Batista, work on him in the corner, hits the snake eyes real early on in a big boot, and yeah. uh, getting the signature spots in real early. Changing it up a little bit, keeping us on our toes. But he gets a two count there, and then Taker rolls to the outside, and I guess he decides that anything goes, I'm going to get me a chair. So he grabs a <laughs> chair from under there and he's going to uh, try to use it here. Well, he didn't have Batista worked over quite enough yet because he brings that chair into the ring and Batista immediately spears him down. Uh, then, but, but Batista tries to use the chair and Taker boots it into him, uh, <laughs> clotheslines Batista, gets another two count, and takes Batista to the outside, slams him into the steps, and then hits a signature spot. You can't have a hell in a cell without this. Uh, he starts doing the old cheese grater on Batista on the cell. <laughs> Oh yeah, and I think I think Batista got like busted open a little bit from this. You can see him later on; he's busted open a little more. But did he get? Did he start bleeding right here? I think it might have been a little hard way cut. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's just a little dot on his head. Yeah, just a little bit. So I think yeah, I think it was hard way. We're gonna our blood track is gonna be dinging uh, later on. So yeah, we got the an apron leg drop from Taker here, and again, he Batista sells it like I've literally only seen him do, and he falls flat back on the outside like only he can, man. And then Taker's going to take one of the, the top steps off and uh, pulls. And he's going to pull an oldie. We haven't seen him do this in a while. He grabs that chair, puts it on Batista's throat, and Takerizes him on top of the steps. You know, yes. he slams that, that that chair into his throat, and Batista starts bleeding from the mouth. So, man, I was happy to see the Takerizer back. Yeah, dude, I love when Undertaker he pulls out something from the past or, or does a new move or something. But, man, he's always... That's the great thing about him. It's not always just the signature stuff. Sometimes he'll reach deep down and do something he hasn't done in a long time. So, And it was perfect for this match here. As he uh, slams the chair into Batista's throat again, uh, gets a two count on him back in the ring. And uh, I just wanted to note here that apparently this match is not false count anywhere. Because that's another thing we've pointed right. out with these Hell in a Cell matches is that the rules fluctuate from match to match. Uh, sometimes they're false count anywhere. Sometimes they're not, uh, but Undertaker keeps rolling Batista into the ring to pin him, so I guess this one is not false count anywhere. Right, yeah, and um, yeah, that is a frustrating thing, and we're, that's not the only thing frustrating. We're going to get some more, uh, I guess, rural discrepancies, uh, a little bit of, you know, well, we'll get to it in a second here. It, it drives me nuts, but uh, anyway, um, w- when Taker's pinning him in the ring, though, at this point, uh, Love it because he's using his – he's doing like the old William Regal kind of like a heel move, but he's putting his 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 forearm on Batista's throat when he's pinning him. I really like that little – just – it's something that may not be obvious to the fans in the crowd, but when you're – but this is a TV product, you know, and when we're watching on TV, you can see that stuff, and it comes out – and like, I hit him in the throat with this. I want to sell that. I want to put it over even more. I'm going to drape my forearm across his throat when I pin him. Like, it's just stuff that – I guess you can teach that, but you just got to do it for mm-hmm. years and years to pick up on the nuance, man, and he's just right. so – good at it you know i love that well the veteran undertaker he's getting in all his stuff here he wrenches the arms a few times goes up top for old school but batista catches him as he's jumping down turns it into a spine buster a nice spot there uh taker and uh, taker and batista both get up to their feet start throwing hands uh, but batista gets the advantage he hits a clothesline for a two count and the action's really good, but I gotta say, man, I really enjoyed JBL and Cole, their commentary here, because it's very much, they're analyzing the action. They're talking about 
uh, uh, yes. strategy of both of these guys. They're talking about their strengths and weaknesses here and why they're doing each move. Uh, I thought it was, mm-hmm. you know, we call them out for all their <laughs> stupid stuff they do, but man, I, I thought they were excellent during this match. This is one of the best, their best commentary matches that we've covered. I mean, seriously, because yeah. they're talking about, oh, Batista's throat is her injured from that chair shot. His mouth, he's he's breathing through his mouth now. His yeah. mouth is open. Look at him. He's winded. He's he's sucking wind through his mouth. He can't he can't last it. It's stuff that you hear like in guys real break sports. down a real fight. Like you have yeah, like yeah. you hear Joe Rogan and Mike Goldberg at this point like break down that kind of stuff. Like oh, you know who who would have been wrestling? Who would have been fighting at this point? Oh, look at Forrest Griffin in there. You know he's he's sucking. He can win is you know they broke his nose. He has to breathe through his mouth. That's the stuff to be saying, and they're presenting this the same way. And I, I really did like it too, man. I really like their uh, their analysis of the match. It really enhanced things, you know. Yeah, it was very uh, Jim Rossish, you know. Honestly, like Jim Ross was good about that kind of stuff, and these guys typically aren't, but they were really <laughs> on it tonight. So yeah, kudos to them. But uh, back outside, uh, Takers get his head hit. Excuse me, Takers head hits the steps from Batista, and Batista throws Taker into the cell. Uh, and clotheslines him in the cell, and then Irish whips, tries to Irish whip him, but Batista gets thrown into the steps, and then uh, commentary keep talking about their previous matches, and Taker picks Batista up and pulls an old Kevin Nash Rey Mysterio special, and just lawn darts him right into the edge of the cell. So always a cool spot. You got you, you have to see that one in a cell match too. It's yep. a staple. And during this time, you got to see some blood, and Batista comes up real yeah. bloody off of that. Taker wax him with a chair again for good measure to keep that blood Ooh, flowing. Yeah. Uh, Taker covers him, gets a two count again. A lot of two counts in this match. Uh, Undertaker goes for old school again, but Batista again catches him, crotches him on the top rope, and gets Undertaker up for another superplex. Yep, from the middle rope, Batista superplexes him, and then they're both kind of selling that exhaustion. He crawls over uh, to go for the pin, but Taker's going to get a burst of energy and lock in that triangle choke. And Batista is just, man, he's bloody. He's re- he really hit a gusher. It's not uh, it's not Eddie Guerrero level. It's not the uh, Brock Lesnar, mm, Undertaker, yeah. held himself level, but it's, it's, it's pretty bad, though. It's pretty bad, but this triangle choke is really neat because Batista got – he winds up rolling over onto his back and Taker's on top of him. And, okay, here's my problem. Michael Cole and JBL, literally both of them say, he, he can't reach for the ropes, he can't break the hold for the ropes, there's no point in doing that. And as he, as they're saying that, Batista grabs the ropes and Mickey J's like, break the hold, break the hold. And then, then they're just quiet like for a few seconds because they don't know what to say because they just got called liars, you know? Like, And I just wrote like, oops, like that sucked. <laughs> because they were doing such a good job of calling this match, and then they got thrown in the garbage right there. You know, I mean, what would you think of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was just a total misfire there from from everybody, seemingly yeah. because, like, immediately afterward. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know if that was supposed to happen because. Like Batista rolls out of the wing, ring, and then Undertaker does like a super sloppy dive onto Batista there. That was like, it seemed <laughs> yeah. like it, that was unplanned. Like he kind of dives through the through the middle rope onto him, and it just it just looks awkward. Like they just kind of got thrown off by that whole sequence there. But yeah, I mean. I- it's one of those things that that happens sometimes with these refs with no DQ, no holds barred matches. Like it's like they don't know what to do with the rope break sometimes. And this was, uh, yeah, uh, and the commentary was confused by it. It was just it, it threw everybody off for for a minute. Yeah, I remember Wrestle Kingdom a few years ago. Jericho and Omega, same thing happened. No DQ match. Jericho or Lion Tamer and Omega got the ropes, and the referee called for. The, the break the hold and Twitter was blown up about it. The online community and Jericho defended it saying it's, it's no DQ. It doesn't mean like that's not a DQ. Like you can still, you still have to break the whole rope or something like that. And he was like trying to defend it. And I'm like, dude, shut up. Like they screwed up. <laughs> like, right. Don't even give me that nonsense. Like red shoes, red shoes messed up. And I'm going to call Mickey J out for messing up here too. So, you know, no DQ dude, that doesn't, there's no rope breaks. So, but anyway, JBL actually calls out Mickey J on oh, yeah. commentary and says, well, he made it, he may have made a mistake there, and he may have just saved Batista. So even though it's a, a, a fluke, 
they make it part of the story here and saying that could have been Batista's way out. Like that could be his his you know his savior for the match here to win it. So I do like that. But um, Batista's propped up in the corner of the cell, like in the in the edge, and Taker grabs the steps to hit him. But Batista gets his feet up and and blocks it, and uh, he's going to throw Taker into the ring post, and then he's going to grab Batista's going to grab the stairs and just hit Taker in the head like I don't know three or four times as he's leaning against the against the cage, and Taker is now busted open. Yep, we got blood everywhere now. Uh, but talk about mistakes, man. Batista has not studied the tape of his previous matches with The Undertaker. He hasn't right. studied the tape of anybody over the past six years because he goes for the dreaded 10 punches in the corner. Uh, he does take a break in the midst of them to bite Undertaker's cut on his head, which was <laughs> a nice little spot. Uh, He's an animal. <laughs> But of course, mark it off your bingo card. Undertaker reverses it into the last ride, uh, but he's exhausted here. He's bloodied, and he takes a little bit too long to cover, and it only gets a two count on Batista. Yeah, but good, uh, good high spot there. Good oh, yeah. big move, big impact move. It gets the crowd in. So one thing we haven't mentioned is this crowd, man. I don't, I don't feel like Miami crowd was into this as 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 much as they should should have been, and until as the basically the ending that we're going to get into now. Did you think that same thing? Same thing, man. I, I you don't think of Miami as okay. a great wrestling crowd, I guess. Um, and I don't know if it's just, it was a long show or whatever, but man, they, yeah, they uh, were not super into this match. Yeah. I don't know why, cause it's, it's good stuff, but it is. anyway, take her uh, you know, after that last ride and the cover, take her going to signal for the choke slam and he actually hits it. And covers for another two count, but Taker can't believe this. You know that that he's given these two of his biggest moves here to Batista, and he's kicked out. So he does the throat slash, gets Batista up for a tombstone, but Batista slips out and hits a spine buster, and he's going to get a two count of his own. Yep, he goes for another spine buster right out of that. Rolls to the outside, finds a table under the ring, gets it into the ring, and hits a Batista bomb through the table. And Undertaker somehow kicks out of that one. That blew me away as a yeah. fan. And as we've been watching this, like how many times have we seen, we've seen Taker go through the announce table on the outside. How many times have we seen him go through a table in a match like this? Yeah. Like seriously, I can probably count on one hand in the last 17 years. He's gone through a table. Yeah. Pretty it's rare. not an announce table, you know, like, so that's a big deal when he, you know, cause he's, He's going to say yay or nay. He's got the clout to say, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. But he's like, no, man, give me your finisher do a table. <laughs> like, that's cool. Like, as a – like, Batista, you know he felt like awesome. Like, this is great. I'm getting to do this to take her. And he's going to kick out. Like, that's – I don't know, man. I just – it's just – it's cool to see as a fan, you know, and as somebody who's going through his career with a fine-tooth comb. Like, we don't see this often. So, uh, I really dug seeing it. It's a big spot there for sure. Uh, and Batista tries to amp it up to another level. He goes and grabs the stairs from the outside, tosses them into the ring, and he goes for uh, an- another Batista bomb. But Taker flips him over, reverses out of it, and Batista lands onto the steps. Uh, and Undertaker covers him there. That only gets a two count again because of a rope break. Uh, from Mickey yes. J. <laughs> he did not get the memo for this match. No, Batista grabs the bottom rope, and yeah, Mickey J calls for the break, and I'm just like, what? I don't know, man. I don't get the rope break thing in an ODQ, no holes barred, no, hell in a cell match. But sense. then again, in 2019, they had a, they had a whatever they had last year. So a no contest. Yeah, the rules are fluid. So anyway, but so. There's that, you know, he, he gets the, the rope break, and then Taker's going to hit a tombstone, just a regular old tombstone, covers him with the classic cover with his, you know, arms folded and tongue out, and Batista, one of the few who kicks out of a mm. tombstone here at 2.9, and uh, crowds into it here. Dude, that's a huge moment right there, <clears throat> and Undertaker's in shock, uh, selling it on his face right there. And he amps it up another level, dude. Gets Batista up on his shoulders, walks up on top of the stairs, carrying Batista with him, which is pretty incredible enough right there. Yeah. And then gives him a tombstone on top of the stairs. Oh. Uh, might as well declare him legally dead after that. 
goes for the cover, wins the world title. Oh, wait a second. Someone has just pulled the referee, Mickey J, out of the ring at two. Who is that? It's a cameraman. Wait a second. Who is that? It's Edge. Edge, oh, the cameraman. What? They take her in the head with the camera. Yeah, Edge has returned here. He's been gone for several months. Again, last we saw him, he had on this show, we, he had beaten Taker for the world title. And then, what, a few not even like, what, six weeks later, he was gone with an injury of his own. So, yeah. had to lose that title to, did he lose it to Greg Kali? And then Kali lost it to Batista, I believe it was. He surrendered it. The way it and went? Kali won Surre- it in the okay. battle royal. That's right. Yeah. So, he never lost it. It's his title that he's yep. never lost. Yep. So, he's here to screw over Taker. Um, so, he's going to. Put Taker's head on the steps at this point and then hit a move, and I'll let you tell us what movie he is. <laughs> well, it's uh, similar to the Concerto, but uh, I guess this would be called the Concerto. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate the, appreciate the courtesy laugh. Right? Uh, oh, oh, no, man. I love it. I love the dad jokes. It's then, my uh, favorite. <laughs> I love it. Edge drags Batista on top of Undertaker, and Mickey J just kind of shakes his head at Edge, and I mean he's got to make the count here. He counts to three. Mm-hmm. Batista retains the title, uh, and like we said at the top, he defeats Triple H and the Undertaker in their signature matches here inside Hell in a Cell. Undertaker falls to four and four inside Hell in a Cell matches. Uh, twenty one minutes twenty four seconds here, and the crowd. The announcers, the fans, I mean, me watching at home, everybody is in shock at this. It is a really well done surprise. Uh, even though Edge was on the poster, uh, I don't think you could say you right. saw this one coming as Edge kind of stands tall over Batista Undertaker, who are both still just laid out after this. Um, Edge runs around and grabs another chair, and as Undertaker sits up, Edge smashes it over his head here, and I love this, dude. They just let this moment play out. They wait like yes. two minutes to play Edge's music afterward. Mm-hmm. He's just kind of standing, looking at these guys. The crowd is just in this shock and awe here. The announcers are talking about it, but they don't just immediately play his music over it. Really well done. Yeah, I noted that too. It's just awesome. It's just yeah, no music playing as he's walking up. JB on court, like, where the heck did he come from? You know, mm-hmm. was he a cameraman in there the whole time, or how did he get in? Nobody can can get in the cell. The door was locked. And they're going over all, all of that, you know. And so, um, let the speculation begin. But yeah, a few minutes go by, and then Alter Bridge hits, and you know, and then uh, Edge is walking backwards up the ramp and kind of look overseeing his destruction. Uh, that he's left in the ring, and again, Batista is still face down at this point in the ring because he's out from that, that tombstone on the stairs. Taker starts to sit up a little bit and kind of holds himself up on the bottom rope, and he rolls his eyes in the back of his head to, you know, in anger and kind of intimidation at Edge, and Edge looks at and Edge kind of watches him as we as we fade to black here. So, man, uh, some brutality, a lot of blood, and I really liked where the, the things kind of picked up toward the end here. Um, these guys going to desperate, you know, desperate measures to beat each other. So I like, I enjoyed this match, but the crowd, the crowd kind of took away from it for me though, honestly. Yeah. Same here, man. The crowd does kind of hinder this match. I would put this one on the same level as last month as the cyber Sunday match, just like a notch below the WrestleMania and backlash matches. Uh, those are like, Mm -hmm. mm, I don't know, four and a half to five stars. I'd say these are, kind of four stars, three and a half to four stars, mm-hmm. both of these two matches. So still really good, not quite uh, up on the level of the uh, the first two. Uh, and, the, you know, just kind of the feud itself feels like it's dragging a little bit. But, man, what a great unexpected return from Edge. And I think having him here just injects new life into the show, into the feud. Yep. Uh, again, like I don't personally, I think you can do a babyface babyface feud. I think it can be fun, but man, just having a heel into the mix of things and a heel to the level of Edge, I'm excited for where things are going to go from here. I think it's going to add a lot more to the show, to the rivalries, to the matches. Yeah, absolutely. And think of Edge too. I mean, he's been a heel for a little while now. Um, and he, he gets good heel heat, but he got good heel heat against Matt Hardy because of real life situations. But then, like in 06, he was a heel. 
but he started getting baby face reactions because he's going against Cena the whole time, and the crowd was starting to turn on Cena. But if you want him to be a bona fide heel, put him against your top two baby faces on SmackDown. You got Batista and the Undertaker. That's a surefire way to get him to be a heel, you know? Like, we, 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 Taker's making Batista turn heel on accident. <laughs> like, so he's definitely going to make Edge a heel, you know? So. Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. And that's going to take us into next month as we close out the year 2007. We notch another one in the record books here as Edge inserts himself right into the middle of this feud. Armageddon 07, Edge, Batista, and The Undertaker in a triple threat match, uh, really escalating the Edge-Undertaker feud to another level, which is going to carry us into 2008. But looking forward to that one. Uh, Really fun match, pretty historic match uh, in the history of Edge and a few other guys who are still on the WWE roster to this day. So that'll be fun to talk about here. Our fellow podcasters out in the world, hint, hint. So uh, that'll be next week's episode. Uh, but until then, as we keep this uh, podcast rolling and rolling and rolling onto the last ride, we want to hear your thoughts about this match, about Hell in a Cell, about the Undertaker Batista rivalry. What's your favorite overall match in their one on one singles matches of their feud? Hit us up with your comments at Talking Taker on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. Leave a comment, leave a rating, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting service like Spotify, YouTube, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, all that good stuff. Uh, We are recording this one a little bit early, so haven't gotten your feedback on this one yet. Maybe we'll insert some stuff on here uh, later on. Who knows? But... We did get some comments and some messages from you from last week's episode. As we said at the top of the show, we made that big reveal that we are heading to New York on March 7th to go one-on-one with The Undertaker for 15 seconds or so. Uh, We're looking forward to it. And we know that Jeremy Bagley, one of our favorite listeners out there, we're going to be able to meet him and spend a little time with him. At Marked Out, MarkedOut.com. They said they're going to be at that meet and greet as well. So maybe we can meet up with them. We're excited about it. And uh, Randy Turco at Pokey's Little Dog. He showed us a few interesting items as suggestions for things that we could get signed by the dead man. Uh, I don't know if I want to give The Undertaker a pair of boxer shorts to get signed by him. But, you know, we're, <laughs> we're open to suggestions. <laughs> We're open to input from you, so if any of you listeners out there have any suggestions for what we should get signed by The Undertaker when we get that meet and greet with him, uh, we'd love to hear from you about that. And uh, we want to continue shouting out our buddies over at the Bottom Line Wrestling Podcast as they go through the career of Stone Cold Steve Austin. We encourage you to go give them a listen wherever you listen to podcasts. And, man, I don't have much else going on. Why is it going to have a tag team named Meet and Greet? Oof. That'd be great. <laughs> I could see <laughs> could it. Could have been uh, John Stasiak. It was me. Somebody else could have been Greek. <laughs> meet and Greet. <laughs> great. I'm down with it, man. Uh, yeah. Meet. Oh, man. Meet. Anyway, sorry. It just it's occurred like the to me alternate name for uh, Heavy Machinery. <laughs> <laughs> alternate universe. They give me Meet and Greet. <laughs> Oh, meet and greet. Awesome. Whenever awesome, they awesome. go to well, yeah, TNA, if you were there, they have to change your names. Yeah, if you were there with the American Airlines Arena in Miami, Florida, uh, let us know. Again, uh, if, the, if, you, if some of you guys dropped off watching after the Benoit tragedy and you haven't seen this, we encourage you to go back and watch it. It's a really, really good match. You need to, you need to check it out, especially if you're a Taker fan. So let us know, let us know what you thought. Yeah, and uh, other than that, ladies and gentlemen, take it easy. You need to relax. Hey, 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 I'm not even, I'm, I'm out here minding my business, Vicky Guerrero. Why are you stalking Jenny, me? Jenny, Jenny, relax. I don't have a lot of time to talk. I still have to finalize The Undertaker and Batista's Hell in a Cell match. Darn Haitians, woman, why, why would you would want to, Jamie Noble versus Batista versus Undertaker, Jamie? Hell in a Cell? Jamie. You're not in that match. That is not it.